Thanks for joining us. It's an honor and a pleasure to have Bob Beecher, CEO, President MPTF with us to, again today. Visiting with the French symbolists is Bob's idea. I will say a little bit about my journey in discovering the symbolists, then Bob will talk about the symbolists, and then he will read, and then I will read, and we'll discuss the poetry. Two or three things I know about the symbolist, that's a nod to Godard's picture, two or three things I know about her. <clears throat> in 1966, in New York City, a fellow actor, Hector Elizondo, in my acting class, taught me how to play the guitar for a play I was doing. When he discovered my interest in poetry, he told me about Baudelaire. That was the first time I heard the name Baudelaire. A few years later, I read Edmund Wilson's Axel's Castle. Wilson writes about the symbolists, Valerie, Baudelaire, Verlaine, Mallarmé, and Rimbaud. Their innovations in French poetry in the late 1800s and their influence on T.S. Eliot, Yeats, Proust, Stein. Rimbaud's illuminations with its simultaneity of images prefigured Cubism and Baudelaire's prose poems influenced the American prose poets. Also, La Tremont uh, figures in there with a prose poem uh, around the same time as Baudelaire. Tracking the principles of symbolism, we have to first look at Edgar Allan Poe, one of its precursors. Baudelaire discovered Poe in 1847. In 1852, Poe's tales were translated and published by Baudelaire. Poe's critical writings were important to the symbolists. Quote, I know we find Poe writing, for example, that indefiniteness is an element of the true music of poetry. I mean of the true musical expression, a suggestive indefiniteness of vague and therefore of spiritual effect. And to approximate the indefiniteness of music was to become one of the principal aims of symbolism. For example, the uh, influence of Poe is the dreamlike irrational musical poetry of Annabelle Lee. And that helped to affect a revolution in France. Now, I'm quoting you from Edmund Wilson. Bob Beecher, we all know he's a great CEO, but what some of the new residents may not know is that he has a tremendous love and passion for literature. He has worked for and supported the Great Quill in the last three issues of its magazine. Bob has a BA in literature from Penn and an MA in American and British Lit from Stanford. He's a superlative prose writer. And one thing that I admire about Bob as well as Jennifer Clymer is that he has a loving support of the creative with a capital C. Here's Bob Beecher. Thank you, Harry. <clears throat> and it's always an honor and a privilege to be on this show with you. Um, and uh, feel very blessed to, to be asked back and to uh, tackle the French symbolists. So you, you've done a wonderful uh, job on the historical background and the influence of Poe uh, on Baudelaire and then Baudelaire's influence on some of the other folks we're going to be uh, reading today, Verlaine, uh, Rambeau, Mallarmé, Apollinaire, and, and Valérie. Um, you know, my, my uh, introduction to French symbolists is kind of pedestrian compared to yours. Um, I think it was in my junior year of high school we were given uh, Au Lecture, Baudelaire's poem, to translate. And it's, uh, it's a, uh, not a complicated poem in terms of uh, vocabulary and language. And uh, so I struggled for you know, uh, several weeks on translating it. And uh, when I got to the end, I, I, I really like this poetry. It's not just a a class assignment. And so I began to <clears throat> read more Baudelaire and then extend uh, my interest and uh, read quite a bit of Valerie uh, in graduate school 
uh, wrote some things uh, about poetry and paraphrase uh, and incorporated a lot of Valerie's, both his prose writings and his poetry into uh, those papers. You know, for me, the, the one in, I love the poetry itself, but uh, as you pointed out, they really are a, uh, uh, a new, they, there's a new lens on the world in the poetry of the symbolists. And as it matured and took different forms, it really did become uh, a big influence on Eliot, uh, Pound, uh, Gertrude Stein. I think uh, Wallace Stevens is heavily influenced by French symbolists. And I actually, uh, somewhere along the way here, I'm going to read maybe the first or second stanza of Sunday morning once we get through some of these other French poets to see whether people, others agree uh, with the kind of aestheticism and symbolism of uh, Wallace Stevens' poetry and its uh, predecessors in the, in the uh, French symbolists. Baudelaire is lumped in with this group, and I think sometimes think that Baudelaire is He's one foot in, one foot out. Uh, but, you know, if you think about what was happening in poetry before this, a uh, very undistinguished century for poetry in France up until the time of Baudelaire. And in England, it's really the influence of the Romantic poets. It's Wordsworth, Coleridge, um, um, trying to think who else. Uh, Keats, Byron, uh, and then sort of the more naturalism of Tennyson, Matthew Arnold, the Victorian poets, Robert Browning, and others, and then up pops this really uh, special uh, poet in Baudelaire. Uh, and he's writing about subjects that are completely different than what these other guys are writing about. He has this dark and uh, grisly view of the world. And uh, as we hear in the first poem that we're gonna read, uh, he talks about ennui for the, I think it's the first time that people start talking about ennui, the, the sense that you know, we have everything and we're, yet we're totally bored. Uh, so maybe it's a good time. I'll, I'll jump into the first poem. How's that? So I'm going to, I'm going to just because uh, I struggled through translating this poem when I was in graduate school, I'm going to read this one and only this one in French, and then I'll read it in, in, in English. Uh, and ex you'll, anyone who knows French will have to excuse me because I'm sure my pronunciation is going to be kind of awful. But anyway. La sottise, l'erreur, le péché, la laissin, occupe nos esprits et travaille nos corps, et nous alimentons nos am amables remords, comme l'homme les médiantes nourrissent leur vermin. Now, you know what? My French is too terrible. I'm going to, I'm going to skip the French. Uh, and I'll read it in English. So it's called O Lecture to the Reader. Ignorance, error, cupidity, and sin possess our souls and exercise our flesh. Habitually, we cultivate remorse as beggars entertain and nurse their lice. Our sins are stubborn. Cowards, when contrite, we overpay confession with our pains. And when we're back again in human mire, vile tears, we think, will wash away our stains. Thrice potent Satan is our cursed bed, lulls us to sleep, our spirit overkissed, until the precious metal of our will is vaporized, that cunning alchemist. Who but the devil pulls our waking strings? Abominations lure us to their side. Each day we take another step to hell. 
descending through the stench, unhorrified. Like an exhausted rake who mouths and chews the martyrized breast of an old withered whore, we steal, in passing, whatever joys we can, squeezing the driest orange all the more. Packed in our brains as incestuous as worms, our demons celebrate in drunken gangs. And when we breathe, that hollow rasp is death, sliding invisibly down into our lungs. If the dull canvas of our wretched life is unembellished with such pretty wear as knives or poison, pyromania, rape, it is because our souls too weak to dare. But in this den of jackals, monkeys, curs, scorpions, buzzards, snakes, this paradise of filthy beasts that screech, howl, grovel, grunt, in this menagerie of mankind's vice, there's one supremely hideous and impure, soft-spoken, not the type to cause a scene. He'd willingly make rubble of the earth and swallow up creation in a yawn. I mean, Ennui, who in his hookah dreams produces hangmen and real tears together. How well you know this fastidious monster, reader, hypocrite reader, you, my double, my brother. Oh, well, you know, you know, uh, that was wonderful, Bob. You know, what I noticed, which is obvious, those last two stanzas, he gets into what you talked about in the beginning, on a week, right. boredom and all that. And also, the, you know, the one thing I noticed about uh, Baudelaire and the others, they're not afraid to write about anything human. I mean, their visions are very often dark, and they deal with Satan or, you know, the nature of evil. But, um, you know, they, you know, and it is a rebellion, obviously, against the more classical neo neoclassical French writers. And as you pointed out, they, uh, they didn't have Shakespeare and Keats and all that, where all the mixture of all the right. similes with the, the use of senses and et cetera, the similes. And so th this really is a, a revolution. Yeah, yeah. And if you just think of, uh, you know, any, any poetry you might have read, English, French, probably German, Italian, up until this point, it's not talking about uh, the uh, the exhausted rake who mouths and chews the martyrized breasts of old withered whores, and it is uh, you know so gritty and uh, dark and uh, you know such a dire view of the world, uh, and in the end the poem says you know take all of that, all of these horrible things that I've just described to you and put them aside because that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is boredom. It's, you know, the unengaged mind, the, the, the person who feels that there's nothing, no sensation, no, nothing that they can do, uh, you know, that will excite them anymore. Sometimes it breaks up the sound. I don't know if you can hear me, but sometimes yeah. my sound, okay. all of a sudden I miss a sentence or two, but, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. And, you know, one thing about me, you know, I hear people say sometimes, oh, I'm bored and this or that. I never use the word boredom. I mean, if I don't want to watch, if I'm watching something, I don't like it, I'll turn it off. Right. But if I'm not, if I'm not doing something I enjoy doing, I won't do it. You know, yeah. but people, you know, they walk around with that sense of boredom, but, uh, you know, I never understand that. Uh, and the other thing, uh, which I was, uh, oh gosh, I was going to say something about the, uh, the, uh, oh God, something about the, the, uh, the symbolism, the symbolist, uh, well, symbolism itself, you know, oh, here's what, it, here's what I was thinking. They also, as, uh, as you and I both know and others, they retired from society. You know, they, they refused to engage in society, you know, whether they were teachers or, you know, some of them almost, one of them almost lunatic, and then they, uh, you know, it's the opposite here. I mean, we cannot, at least I cannot, and you certainly cannot, uh, you know, afford to not uh, engage in society. 
I mean, right. if you're an actor, you always have to be going out there. If you're a writer, you can go into a cave. But these people <clears throat> retired. They found literature, the imagination as a refuge. Yeah. So that's all part of the, the yeah. symbolism, too. Yeah, absolutely. But you think of this ther this theme of ennui, it carries on into the you know beginning of the 20th century. I, you know, I always think of uh, the movie Cabaret. You know, it's all about people who are just so bored that they're seeking sensation after sensation because that's the only thing that can uh, resonate with them. Also, what I wondered about, you know, when at the, that last uh, stanza where he talks about, you know, actually implying that any action you do is better than ennui. And right. that seems to be like a precursor of existentialism. Mm -hmm. so even if you do something negative, it's a positive act, you know, like in The right. Stranger, uh, an act of feeling. Right. As opposed to just the sense of indifference. Yeah. That, you know, that we've always, remember Bobby Kennedy used to talk about that indifference being the worst sin where you're on the fence as opposed to making a move. Uh, right. uh, thank you. That was an excellent opening. Do you want me to do another Baudelaire, Harry, or do you want to? Yeah, absolutely. Why don't you do that and then, uh, you know, do one or two, whatever you'd like, a Baudelaire. Okay, I'm going to read the next one I'm going to read is called Labatro or the Albatross. Oft times for diversion, seafaring men capture albatross. Those vast birds of the sea that accompany at languorous pace boats plying through their bitter straits. Having scarce been taken aboard, these kings of the blue, awkward and shy, piteously their great white wings let droop like oars at their sides. This winged voyager, how clumsy he is and weak. He just now so lovely, how comic and ugly. One with a stubby pipe teases his beak. Another mimics, limping, the cripple who could fly. The poet resembles this prince of the clouds, who laughs at hunters and haunts the storms, exiled to the ground amid the jeering pack. His giant wings will not let him walk. So you know, very... that reminds me of the poet, you know, when he talks about poet in the last stanza, it almost seems to me he's using a metaphor and saying the poet is not of this world. Right. You know, he can't, you know, he wants to fly, and yet he has to do that within the imagination. Yeah. You know, but, you know, they're, they're very good with, you know, with uh, metaphors and similes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's a beautiful one about the, uh, the poet as the albatross, who is, uh, when he's in the life of the mind and the creative world, and as you say, by himself, writing... Uh, he's alive and vibrant, and then when he's uh, among the world, uh, he, he's awkward and, uh, you know, exiled. Yeah. Well, let's see. I think the swan is going to be too long for me to read. Oh, that, that's fine if you like, but do as you please. We have time. Or... Do as if, whatever you please, Bob, please. I think I'm going to read The Seven Old Men. And this one is uh, dedicated by Baudelaire to Victor Hugo. Teeming city full of dreams, where in broad daylight the specter grips the passerby. Mystery flows everywhere like sap in the ducts of the mighty Colossus. One morning when mist in the gloomy street made the houses seem taller, like the two caves of a swollen river, when, decor in harmony with the state of my soul, a foul yellow fog inundated space, I went, stealing my nerves like a hero, disputing with my soul, already weary, among the faubourg jarred by heavy carts. Suddenly I saw an old man in rags of the same yellow as the rainy sky, whose aspect would have made alms rain down except for the wicked gleam in his eye. You might have thought the pupils of his eyes were soaked in bile. His gaze sharpened the sleet and his beard of long hairs, stiff as a sword, jutted forward like the beard of Judas. 
He was not bowed, but broken, for his spine made a perfect right angle with his leg, so that his staff, completing his presence, gave him the bearing and the clumsy gait of a crippled dog or three-legged Jew. He stumbled over the snow and mud as though he were grinding the dead under his shoes, hostile to life, more than indifferent. His like followed him, beard, eye, back, staff, rags, nothing distinguished, come from the same hell. This centenarian twin and these specters walked with the same step towards an unknown goal. Of what inf infamous scheme was I the butt, or what ill chance humiliated me? Full seven times from minute to minute, I saw this old man multiply himself. That him who laughs at my disquietude and is not seized by a fraternal chill, ponder that. For all their decrepitude, these seven monsters appeared eternal. Would I, and lived, have beheld the eighth counterpart, ironical and fatal, vile phoenix, father and son of himself? I turned back on the procession. Enraged as a drunk man who sees double, I went inside and closed my door, frightened, sick, and chilled, my mind feverish and turbid offended by the senseless mystery. In vain, my reason tried to take the helm. The tempest rollicking led it astray, and my soul danced, danced like an old lighter without masts on a monstrous shoreless sea. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, you know, the one thing about Baudelaire, you know, his depiction of, you know, this uh, hideous figure, and, you know, what I admire about art is that you can take whether it's violence or evil or anything dark and work with it within a frame. I mean, yeah. I, obviously, we don't want to be committing violence or doing evil things in real life, but within a framework, whether it's a film or a, a painting or a, a poem, it, you, you release that vision and, and uh, you know, turn that, uh, that imagination into something positive and create a work of art which I think is a positive thing, you know? Yeah, no, I agree with you, Harry. This is, uh, again, it's, you know, it's the symbolist uh, kind of transcendence, the use of symbols and uh, art for art's sake and uh, willingness to depict, you know, very dark uh, underworld of life. Uh, and embrace it and and uh, make it into, you know, turn it into something beautiful. With that, I will, you know, uh, with that, I will move into Verlaine, yeah. if, if I may. And Verlaine was born in 1844 and he died in 1846. And uh, as a young man, he read Baudelaire's Flowers of Evil, and that inspired him to write. And, uh, you know, we all have heard the story of him getting a letter from Rambeau he was married, uh, had a child, and then, you know, running off with Rambeau and then, you know, ultimately shooting him in the wrist and serving time in the pen for 18 months. And then later on, after trying to teach and ending up in slums and uh, hospitals and all that, he, um, France, being a lover of the arts, they were able to support him and resurrect him and uh, brought an income to him. And the, his fellow poets, they... Uh, Okay, uh, I will now read The Nightingale by Paul Verlaine. Like a clamorous flock of startled birds, all my memories swoop upon me, swoop among the yellow foliage of my heart, watching its bent alder trunk in the purple foil of the waters of regret that flow nearby in melancholy wise. They swoop and then the horrid clamor that a moist breeze calms as it rises, dies gradually in the tree until at the end of a moment, nothing more is heard, nothing but the voice hymning the absent one, nothing but the voice, the languishing voice of the bird that was my earliest love, singing still as on that earliest day and in the sad magnificence of a moon that rises with pale solemnity, a summer night heavy and melancholy, full of silence and obscurity, lulls in the sky that a soft wind caresses, the quivering tree and the weeping bird. 
And that, you know, that poem to me is lyrical and it's also elegiac. Uh, and at the end, we see how mournful it is. You know, Bob, you know, since you know French, uh, obviously I don't, but uh, it seems to me that there's probably more uh, ad assonance and rhyming and yes. something shorter, uh, shorter lines than there would be in English. Is that correct? Yes, Harry. And, uh, you know, these, uh, these poems, because we're reading them in translation, uh, are very different than they are in the original French. This is, in, in the French, it's a rhyming poem. It's A, A, B, B, C, C, you know, D, D, and so on. Uh, and they're very tightly constructed. This is not uh, kind of free, uh, unstructured verse. It's very, it's, it's, for all their wildness in uh, subject matter, and uh, all of that stuff, it's, it's very formalized poetry. Well, the French have always been, you know, going back to Racine, they've right. always been very strict. I remember Racine one time writing criticism of Shakespeare saying he was too sprawling. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're saying Phaedra, you know, his yeah. Phaedra, you know, that was uh, their, their ideal. But, uh, right. Yeah, I like Verlaine. Yeah, this is uh, this is such a wonderful poem uh, because it, it it kind of takes us on a journey, uh, you know, of this uh, uh, of these memories that are swooping on him, and uh, then it just spills out from there. Can you hear okay, Harry? No. Okay. I can, I'm back now. Yeah, you're back, you're back now. Okay, so I, I'm gonna uh, now read a Verlaine poem, Apathy. I seem to be the ennui and apathy uh, king for today. I am the empire at the end of its decadence, watching the tall, fair barbarians pass. Meanwhile, I compose idle acrostics in a golden style where the sun's languors dance. Intense boredom sickens a soul alone. Over there, I hear along bloody battle ranges, feeble with too slow desire. There is no power. There is no will to make this existence flower. There is no will, no power even to die a little. Ah, all is drunk, Bathyllus. Do you laugh still? Ah. All is drunk, all eaten, no more to tell. Nothing but a stupid poem to throw on the fire. Nothing but a faithless slave to neglect you. Nothing but a nameless boredom to afflict you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, it's uh, intense boredom sickens the soul alone. I mean, that's kind of at the core of so much of what they write, it's that it is the soul alone, divorced from the world, uh, you know, writing writing poetry and during a period where apparently uh, apathy and longer, as they call it in uh, French and ennui are kind of pervasive. Well, also some of them were looking for like a pure, a pure poetry you know, and they were looking to do something new. Yeah. So, I mean, Pounds, you know, make it new certainly isn't the first time somebody said something like that. But, you know, I think that's a good thing to think about as we grow older. You know, Eliot said, old men ought to be explorers. And I think that we should always be looking, whatever art form you work in, always look for something new. You know, how to put new things together, generate new meanings. And uh, so I think it's a good lesson uh, for all of us to just keep uh, keep exploring and, uh, you know, keep trying to exist even on a finer level, you know. Harry, do you want to go on to Rambeau now? Well, what about, uh, I thought you were going to do some cemetery by the sea. Well, that's Valerie, not Berlin. Oh, well, that's Valerie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay yeah, I, I, if, we have time, if we have time, I'll do that towards okay. the end. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, so that's okay. So you want me? So we're going to go. I, I I think I heard you. Maybe I didn't. 
So you want, want me to go on to Rambo? Yeah, why don't you do the drunken boat? Okay, so uh, just to remind people, Rambo was born in 1854 in France, and he was prophetic. He wrote, quote, I say that one must be a visionary, that one must make oneself a visionary. The poet makes himself a visionary through a long, immense, and reasoned derangement of all the senses. That's a, you know, derangement of the senses. That's one quote that we've heard a lot about when we talk about right. Rambo. Right. Okay, the, the Drunken Boat by um, Rambo. As I descended black and passive rivers, I sensed that hollers were no longer guiding me. Screaming redskins took them for their targets, nailed nude to colored stakes, barbaric trees. I was indifferent to all my crews. I carried English cottons, Flemish wheat. When the disturbing din of holler ceased, the rivers let me ramble where I willed. Through the furious ripping of the sea's mad tides, last winter deafer than an infant's mind, I ran and drifting green peninsulas did not know roar more gleefully unkind. A tempest blessed my vigils on the sea. Lighter than a cork, I danced on the waves, those endless rollers, as they say, of graves. Ten nights beyond the lanterns, a lantern silly eye, sweeter than sourest apple flesh to children. Green water seeped into my pine wood hull and washed away blue wine stains, vomitings, scattering rudder, anchor, man's lost rule. And then I, trembling, plunged into the poem of the sea, infused with stars, milk Bitter reds of love ferment the way. I know skies splitting into light, world spouts of water, surfs and currents. I know the night, the dawn exalted like a flock of doves, pure wing. And I have seen what men imagine they have seen. I saw the low sun stained with mystic horrors, lighting long, curdled clouds of violet like actors in a very ancient play, waves rolling distant thrills like lattice light. I dreamed of green night, stirred by dazzling snows of kisses rising to the sea's eyes, slowly the sap-like chorusing of surprising currents and singing phosphors flaring blue and gold. I followed for whole months a surge like herds of insane cattle in assault on the reefs, unhopeful that three Marys come on luminous feet could force a muzzle on the panting seas. Yes, I struck incredible Floridas that mingled flowers in the eyes of panthers and skins of men and rainbows bridled green herds beneath the horizon of the seas. I saw the ferment of enormous marshes, weirs where a whole leviathan lies rotting in the weeds, a lapse of waters within calms at sea and distances in cataract toward chasms. Glacier, silver suns, pearl waves, and skies like coals, hideous wrecks at the bottom of brown gulfs where giant serpents eaten by red bugs drop from twisted trees and shed a black perfume. I should have liked to show the young, those dolphins and blue waves, those golden fish, those fish that sing. Foam like flowers rocked my sleepy drifting, and now and then fine winds supplied me wings. When, feeling like a martyr, I tired of poles and zones, the sea whose sobbing made my tossing sweet, raised me its dark flowers deep and yellow world, and like a woman I fell on my knees. Peninsula I tossed upon my shores, the corals and droppings of clamorous blonde-eyed birds. I sailed until across my rotting forge, drowned men, spinning backwards, fell asleep. Now I, a lost boat in the hair of coves, hurled by tempests into a birdless air, I, whose drunken 
carcass neither monitors nor pants as ships with fish back for men's care. Free, smoking, rigged with violet fogs. I who pierce the red sky like a wall that carries exquisite mixtures for good poets, lichens of sun and azure mucus veils, who spotted with electric crescents ran like a mad plank escorted by seahorses when cudgel blows of hot July struck down the sea blue skies upon wild water spouts. I who trembled feeling the moan at 50 leagues of rotting behemoths and thick maelstroms. I, eternal weaver of blue immobilities, I long for Europe with its ancient quays. I saw sidereal archipelagos and isles whose delirious skies are open to the voyager. Is it in depthless night you sleep your exile a million golden birds of future vigor? But truly, I have wept too much, the dawns disturb. All moons are painful and all suns break bitterly. Love has swollen me with drunken torpors. Oh, that my keel might break and spin me in the sea of European waters. I desire only the black cold puddle in a scented twilight where a child of sorrow squats and sets the sails of a boat as frail as a butterfly in May. I can no longer bathe in languors. Oh, waves cross the wake of cotton bears on long trips, nor ramble in a pride of flags and flares, nor swim beneath the horrible eyes of prison ships. Wow. Harry, you read that so beautifully. It's, it's a, such a powerful poem. Well, it's a great visionary poem. And, you know, as I mentioned to you, uh, in an email, I, I, when I read this, read this, I thought, I bet that Bob Dylan was influenced yeah. this, you know, by this with that, you know, his song, A Hard Rain is Gonna Fall. Yeah. You know, I mean, even a, a little phrase is interesting. Like, I think he said in here, he said something like blonde-eyed birds. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, he's, you know, that guy, he really is a singer, you know. The youth, too. I mean, you know, he, okay, he's he was born in 54. I'm not sure when this poem was written. And he died in 90, 1891, so that makes him, what, 37 when he died. Yeah. So, all that youthful energy. And, you know, just a, a brief aside about reading these uh, these, poet, these poets at an old age. I'm 80, and I don't feel the way these people do anymore. I mean, when I was a young man, I would feel very rageful, and you know, Rambo is full of invective, and uh, you know, uh, enticing evil, uh, you know, and his idea of a new Christ, uh, a new gods, I should say, uh, you know, that includes a, a new kind of violence uh, along with salvation and love. But it just, uh, I think these, there's something about this, at least for me, I don't, I don't have those, um, a big powerful feelings of rage anymore. Maybe I, I, without making a generalization, I just feel a more uh, neutral, uh, you know, a more uh, elegiac feeling uh, and appreciation, gratitude than I, than I did when I was a younger man. Yeah. Yeah. And most of these, most of these symbolist poetries, as I recall, or poets, I should say, they came from sort of middle class to upper middle class families. They were uh, well-educated, uh, they were, uh, some of them like Valerie and Baudelaire were critics and artists, uh, uh, painters themselves. Um, yeah, but they had, uh, they were, they were rebelling. They were seeing the world in a very different way than people had seen it before. And, and said, you know, I read somewhere where, uh, you know, Rambeau, like in three years from age 16 to 19, he just devoured literature and ideas uh you know that came before him you know so uh, as you said they were very well educated yeah. and i don't know which one it was i i have it in my notes somewhere maybe it's uh mallarmé or berlin where he would hold court and all these great artists would come to him you know at at, uh, at his house his little apartment in paris and he would uh yeah 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 have a these salons yeah 
So uh, maybe, uh, Harry, if next, maybe uh, I'm looking at the time. Maybe uh, I'll read uh, Ma Mallarmé's The Tomb of Edgar, Edgar Poe. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I uh, apologize, but I haven't done the uh, biographical background for Mallarmé. I don't know whether you do you have that. You know, I, I probably, you know, Bell. Mallarmé, well, Mallarmé was born in 1842, and he was, uh, he died in 1808. You know, that's, uh, you know, I think that's about, uh, let me just see one one quick thing here. Um, I, I probably have it somewhere, but I don't have it right in front of me. But I, I guess the dates of... Okay, uh, all right. So he was a contemporary of most of these, Rambeau, Mallarmé, Verlaine... Baudelaire comes a little bit before them, and I think Valerie comes a little bit after. Well, one brief thing about, you asked me about Bio Mallarmé. I found this one little, it said Mallarmé was a professor who lived quietly and modesty, modestly among his books. Yep. Okay. The Tomb of Edgar Poe, even as eternity brings him at last to himself, the poet revives with a naked sword his age aghast and having failed to be aware of a triumph over death in that strange voice. They, like a hydra's vile start once having heard, the angel give a pure meaning to the words of the tribe, loudly proclaimed that witchery imbibed in the dishonored flow of some foul brew. From hostile soil and cloud, O oh grief, if our idea cannot carve out a bas-relief to adorn the dazzling monument of Poe, silent stone fallen here below from some dim disaster, may at least this granite forever be a bourne to the black flights that blasphemy may spread hereafter. Yeah. Well, you know, th you know that's, uh, that's another interesting thing, how, how they all adored Poe. And, you know, in, in our... Uh, country, there are, you know, we we get Poe early, and, you know, the, Roger Corman, uh, you know, one time I was I was doing a picture, and Tom Hanks yells out of Roger Corman, who was also in the picture, he says, tell me, Mr. Corman, is the only reason you did the pit and the pendulum and the raven because you didn't have to pay for the property? <laughs> you know, but uh, the, uh, you know, the fascination with Poe, the musicality of him, whereas, uh, you know, in the 20th century, most poets, they, you uh, they went more for the sense of things than the musicality of things. Yeah. I, know, I know the English, you know, we all love uh, Dylan Thomas. He was one who could really get into all the assonance and all that. But um, Poe was not quite, you know, younger, you, you know, the younger audience, you know, we pick Poe up early, but uh, it's interesting how they really adored him. Yes, yeah. And I think it was Valerie, uh, in a essay he wrote about the uh, La Cimetière Marin, the graveyard by the sea, that he says the poem first came to him as a, a piece of music. Uh, and then he just filled the words in uh, to match what he had, what he had heard. And it was almost, you know, it, it was what Poe described uh, in his writing of poetry, you know, which was the sort of unconscious uh it just came from somewhere i wasn't aware of where it was coming from or how it was coming out just the words were you know appearing on the page uh valerie describes his writing of poetry the same way it's not about the words it's about the sound they make and matching this music that he heard in his head well you know and poetry really uh you know it it I, I forget i don't know what the word is but it would like to be like music Yes. You know, really great poetry because, you know, I don't have the book anymore, but at one time I had a book of uh, Cemetery by the Sea. And, uh, you know, my memory is it was about 120 pages long. And the poem itself is not that long, obviously. Uh, I don't know how many pages, five or so, but uh, there was all this commentary on it. I mean, it really is a, yeah, that, I had that book right there. And I love that book. And yeah. you read it, and you just, it's like so much, you know, the mystery, it's still there and it's so beautifully done. So we have about, uh, nine minutes left, Bob. Why don't you, uh, you know, talk about or read some whatever you would like on uh, Cemetery of the Sea, if you would like. 
Sure. Uh, Paul, do one second here. So I, I'm hoping to um, hop in here really quickly while Bob gets these items. We haven't really done much about Poe in your um, in your hours, your hours and hours and hours of poetry shows. I am such a huge fan of his uh, because of the musicality of it, because obviously mm -hmm. that's something that really resonates with me. We also Listen. haven't done a lot of Shakespeare, and I'm wondering if that's something you would consider in so, future. So shows. overrated, Jen. So overrated. I, I, don't, I don't think people. I don't think people will be reading him in the future. No, you're probably <laughs> right. Oh, Harry's, uh, could, Harry's frozen. Oh, uh, Harry's frozen. We could definitely do. We could do Shakespeare's sonnets, Harry. That'd be fun to get a bunch of people to read Shakespeare's sonnets. And and you know we could also we could also do I. Uh, we could also do uh, Poe. Uh, you know, I, you know, there are people here uh, on residents who have talked to me about. Uh, you know, I asked them about poetry. You know, somebody will talk about Poe. They'll talk about the Raven, or they'll yeah. talk about a, a poem like the Highwayman. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, a lot of people get poetry in grade school, yeah. and then they don't really continue in poetry. You know, Bob has, uh, and and I have, and others have. But it's a good idea. Both of your ideas are good. So uh, let's, I'll, I will write both of them down and they will both be great ideas to get yeah. uh, uh, residents involved in yeah. reading some of those poems. And that, you know, that's one of the purposes that I've been trying to do is, uh, you know, number one, when Jennifer asked me to do this, I, 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 I told her yes, because if Jennifer asked me to, you know, walk to, to the uh, Staples Center, I would do it for her. <clears throat> but also, uh, I, I wanted to present excellent poetry, and I wanted to get residents involved, and I wanted to get, uh, and even some of the residents who have read, I asked them, uh, you know, have you read poetry publicly before? And they said no. And I said, would you be open to trying, like Corinne, for example? And she's a marvelous reader. She really so, you is, know, that's yeah. part of the purpose, too. And then the other purpose is to show the innovations, like Bob, Bob's idea today, the similar poets, to show the uh, the uh, the innovation, so Bob, uh, you know we have uh, five minutes yeah. left. So what what would you like to do to close this show? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the graveyard by the sea. I mean, it's a poem that's way too long for us to read. Uh, so I just might read a st uh, stanza or two, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, rely on this book, Harry. Our 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 paths cross so many interesting ways, and this very that. probably very obscure book is one that I own and you once owned. Yeah, I love that book. So the uh, I'm going to read from this commentary on the graveyard by the sea. Valerie's own account of the genesis of the poem is well known, and this is a translating from what Valerie wrote. In the case of Le Cimetière Marin, this intention was originally no more than a rhythmic pattern empty, or rather filled with meaningless syllables, which came to obsess me for a time. Little by little, he states, theme, sound, and sense developed out of this rhythmic pattern. It was a rhythm which came to obsess him. So, uh, you know, this music, you, you've been talking about it uh, quite a few times, this musicality uh, of language uh, was really essential to many of the symbolists. And, course we lose it a little bit because we're reading them in translation and uh i i have heard graveyard by the sea read in french uh i found a recording once and uh you know it, it's such a it's a very different experience because the you get to it's got very uh interesting internal uh rhyming structure uh so it's uh you know it's not this free form poem that it seems like it is in english so the first, the first couple of stanzas here. This peaceful roof where doves are walking pulses between the tombs, between the pines. Noonday that just composes out of fires, the sea, the sea forever recommencing. After a thought, oh then what re recompense, a long gaze at the God's serenity. How finely work the flashing that consumes many a diamond of invisible foam. How true was the peace that seems to be conceived. 
the sun reposes over the abyss and pure crea creations of an eternal cause, time scintillates and dreaming is to know. Minerva's temple unadorned, sure treasure, mass of calm, invisible reserve, haughty and pensive water, I concealing so much of sleep under veil of flame, my silence, mansion in the soul and roof, yes, golden summit of 10,000 tiles. And it goes on from there, but it's, you know, it, it's a, just like uh, 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 Le Bateau Eve, the drunken boat that you read, um, the, the Rambeau poem. This is a meditation uh, of a person sitting on a hill in a graveyard overlooking the sea and just the, the, the rhythmic flow of the waves back and forth. We've all experienced this and the clouds overhead tell a story. Uh, right. I mean, sometimes they're big waves, small waves. They come up hard. They come up slow. There are long breaks between them, short breaks. They have different amplitudes. And uh, for him, the sound, the whole kind of mixing of the sensations and just sitting there watching uh, the movement of the sea, the day passing in this kind of meditative space of the graveyard causes him to write this beautiful lyric poetry. And you can read it over and over again. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it's, we got two minutes. I just wanted to close by talking about, you brought up the term again, in which I use to musicality. And in, uh, in uh, one of his essays, Valerie wrote that the difference between prose and poetry is like that between walking and dancing. Right. Prose, he says, is purely utilitarian it is a language serving a function, the way walking serves to move a person from one place to another. In prose, words disappear into their meaning and cease to exist on their own account. Uh, poetry, meanwhile, is like a dance, a movement that serves no function beyond itself and indeed calls attention only to itself. In poetry, sound and music are more important even than what the words signify. Uh, so, you know, uh, Bob, this was a wonderful idea. And, you know, this even reading and hearing these words uh, and, and discussing them with you and Jennifer, too, it's also uh, really um, gets me excited. And yeah. it, it's uh, inspirational for me. And uh, I want to thank you very much for, for you your, your participation, for sending me these poems that we read from today in the first place. Oops. And for early on in the show, when I was uh, introducing Bob, I, I mentioned uh, a, a quality that you both share, Bob and you, and that is something that I admire, uh, and that is a loving support of the creative. So thank you very much for that, uh, not only for me, but for all the residents here at MPTF. It's really, uh, you know, a unique place to live, and we're grateful to have both of you here. Thank you both. Thank you, Harry. Thank, Thank you, you Harry. so much. And for me, it, it's always a great uh, hour to journey with you through uh, through the the, po the world of poetry. And this one was special to me. It took me took me back to uh, some poems I hadn't uh, read or experienced in a while. I, my my guess is you too. And, uh, you know, for I th hope for both of us and for Jan and for everyone else who heard them. It opens a new lens onto the world and, you know, we start seeing clouds differently or we start experiencing uh, our walks around the campus differently. And, uh, you know, it's just so healthy for our souls and our minds to get out of these little ruts that we, you know, sometimes form and uh, see the world through other, pe through other eyes. And I think, Harry, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be back with a totally new experience for the both of us. We're going to be, I, I've got the collected poems of Louise Gluck, uh, the recent Pulitzer Prize winner. And uh, I'm, I'm, if it's okay with you, I'm just going to pull a dozen or more poems out. And uh, I'll, I'll try to get some advice from other people about the most interesting Louise Gluck poems. I haven't read her. Um, and we'll have uh, 
maybe you and I can read some, and then Corinne and others can read as well Very and good. See, see what we all make of it. I, uh, I'm excited about it because she's obviously a great poet, and you know, not she's not in my world right now, so I'm going to welcome a new friend. Do you know when this will be? Is that the the third? Well, whatever the first the Friday fourth. is. The fourth. The fourth. Fourth of December. Yeah. Yep. Fourth of December. Great. Yeah. So I so I better get uh, I better get through that book, and I'll make some copies uh, next week. Maybe I'll, I'll look at it this weekend, and we'll have both have some time, and we can distribute them, and yeah, we'll have a good time. We'll have Thanks a good time. Bob. Yep. Thank you, Harry. Thank you.